Awo Shalom Ras Tafari Ine Ras Yadinos Tafari Ine Or to the Brotherhood I am Wendem Brother Yadom Now what we like to do in this particular Let's just get this set up right here Um Okay What we like to do this is This will be the continuation Of a 2000 and nine, uh, 2009 uh, um, audio lecture, and part of this is being recorded audially as a second part to a revisiting of uh, Kedus Georgis or St. George. Who was St. George? Now, recently, this is 2011, recently we've posted a couple of uh, videos on um, St. George and the connection with uh, 2012 and some of the ancient archetypes, these these ancient archetypes. Now, for example, um, let us show a picture, if we can, of the traditional Ethiopian um, rendering or illumination. Actually, it's an illumination, correctly speaking, it's illumination, although we might only have this in black and white of St. George and the Dragon, St. George and the Dragon. Now, what needs to be supplemented to the 2000 and the 2009 lecture is His Majesty's um, Independence Day speech, his Independence Day speech that was May 5th, two th uh, May 5th, uh, 1941. May 5th, 1941, when Ethiopia, along with her her allies at that particular time, and her ally at that particular time was Great Britain, along with Great Britain, whose patron saint also is St. George. So Great Britain also shares the, um, the saintly patronage of Holy George, of Caduce Georgis. Now, who is St. George? We also know that from his Imperial Majesty and through his Imperial Majesty, St. George is a, is, is, is a very prominent archetype or symbolic. You understand, both being the patron saint of Ethiopia, his Imperial Majesty gave St. George a particular prominence, his, his memory is the Metasebia, the Metasebia or the memorial or memory of St. George. It was very important for his Imperial Majesty and to his Imperial Majesty. In fact, if you study some of the art and facts, some of the artifacts of Imperial Ethiopia, and in particular, Kedamawi Haile Selassie, you will find that St. George is usually represented on the crown, within the, the orb of the crown, we have St. George and the dragon, or St. George conquering the dragon, or as some present as St. George slaying the dragon. But it's important that we recognize, first of all, who is St. George, and this is why we did the 09 uh, audio CD. So we encourage you all to check out that particular CD that we put out formally, and for those who have already checked out that particular CD, this is building on that teaching there in, 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 um, in connection with the most recent series of videos that we have put out roughly, uh, was this December, December 2011, in December 2011 on our YouTube's Ethiopian World Net, we've posted a couple of videos in connection with the 2012 and in connection with uh, St. George, re-examining that particular um, archetype or symbolic in connection with what it is, it is um, predicted humanity is going through right now based on some of the ancient calendars such as the Mayan calendar and uh, other cultures which which were said to have foreseen this particular time and the celestial or the heavenly connection. Now, Nostradamus was also mentioned. Nostradamus was also mentioned in that because there was a video, the History Channel video, 
where they was connecting Nostradamus in 2012, and there's a lost book, an alleged lost book that was found in Vatican archives in some of their secret stashes that was concerning um, the 2012, and it's ascribed to um, Nostradamus. And there were illuminations within that particular manuscripts. And the first thing that we noticed when we uh, re-examined the video is that the Nostradamus illuminations in 2012 connect with what we had already seen within older and more ancient Ethiopic manuscripts and illuminations, such as this one right here. Let's, uh, this book is known as the Malika'a, the Malika'a Georgis, which simply translated would be the the image of George, the image of Georgis. And we call this one of the Ethiopian uh, Dersan, or part of the Dersana, or we call it the Ethiopic Midrash, the Ethiopic Midrash. And this is this particular book right here, as you can see, um, the Malika'a Georgis. And then we have in here, this is this is the opening page right here, all right, um, and then we have this right here, okay, all right, and let's see if we can, uh, now this is uh, one of the, one of the um, traditional images right here, I can show you this right here. Then zoom in on it a little bit right there. All right, now, unfortunately, in this particular teaching, we're just going to go over some of the basics, but hopefully in further uh, productions, we'll be able to, to really have some of the other illuminations as well from the Ethiopic perspective. But now, in the picture of St. George, and the dragon, you will notice that there's a woman. Now, the, the story goes that St. George, well, the simplest version. Now, like I said, there's two different traditions. There's the older and more ancient Ethiopic tradition, and then there's the more modern Western and European or British tradition. Now, the, the best way to explain the contrast between these two traditions of St. George is when we look at the story of Christ. Let's look at the story of Jesus Christos Getach and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for a moment. We have the Bible, and we have what the Bible is seeking to be an accurate witness of, and then we have modern Christianity with Santa Claus and reindeer and a lot of other um, distractions which people take to be Christmas or, or Christianity or the birth of Jesus or this whole Christian idea, Martin, which is 180 degrees opposite of the original, you know, the original Bible and, and the original story, the true story. So when people look at, say, Christmas, when you say Christmas, it's, it's supposed to be Christmas or, or the birth of Christ or the birth of Jesus as it were, but what is being projected, there's, a, there's other stories that have been um, superimposed over the original archetype or the original template, and some even can now take the birth of Christ from its biblical context and see even an older, either a prophecy either an older religion, some say Egyptian Christianity, when we look at ancient Egypt, there was a form of what some say was basic Christianity. We have the same basic elementals. And this is interesting because Christ often says in the beginning, and he seems to point to an older beginning than the canonical Gospels. He's pointing to an older beginning from, from the very beginning. And when we speak about Christ being there from a Christian perspective, he is, he is from ancient times, from old, then we can also now see how 
the older roots of true Christianity are Egyptian and are Ethiopic from its very roots. So we're coming full cipher. We're coming full cipher. Now, with this, let's touch on for a moment a new day. Now, this this uh, could be the next the next part of um, the next part of what we are uh, seeking to uh, teach on right here. Right, the new day. This is a speech of His Imperial Majesty. As you can see it right here. We got some shadows right there on the on the video. Um, but let's let's touch on this within the remaining time that we have in this recording right here. Now a new day. Now what's significant about it? Let's clear the board. Let us uh, clear the board for a moment. Right. Let us let us clear this. This is what the Mets uh, produced the Book of the Seven Seals. Now we mentioned before that St. George and um, Mikael or Michael from the biblical, from the, the book of Revelation, we can see that it's based on the same essential type or archetype, both St. George and then the St. George versus the dragon or St. George and the dragon. And then we have the archangel Mikael, whose name means one who is like God, one who is like God, casting down that old serpent who is known as the devil and Satan and his angels, casting them down from heaven. So we can see within these two, within these two archetypes, there's a, there, or, or these two, these two symbolisms, or the symbolisms of both of them, a similar structure, a similar structure, one for the other. Now. All of these things have really come about into full manifestation. This is now the half of the story concerning St. George on May 5th, 1941. May 5th, 1941. Now, that's where we take the historical St. George. Who was he? He was a Christian martyr. Let's put this on the board for a moment. Those who are able to take this down. We were speaking of Kedus Giyar Gis. Kedus Giyar Gis. Or Holy George. And this is Kedus Kedus. This would be Giyar Geese. Now, in the West, and that's known as George, right? George. And this will be considered holy or in some form saint. So we have saint, right? Holy from the Kedus. Now, there's a couple of things we need to understand right here at, at the outset concerning Saint George. Because in order to understand the importance of his imperial majesties, reference to St. George here, one has to understand the context in which his imperial majesty is, is bearing witness or is testifying. So if you don't understand who St. George, yes, St. George and the dragon, yes, St. George conquered the dragon. Some say he slew the dragon, but he did not slay the dragon, but he did conquer the dragon. So we need to understand that from the Western tradition, in the Western um, British uh, tradition, His Majesty pointed out in this particular speech concerning um, St. George, he says right here in the last paragraph down here, he says, take care not to spoil the good name of Ethiopia hmm. by acts which are worthy of the enemy. We shall see that our enemies are disarmed and sent the way they came. That's very significant. His Majesty said that we're going to see that our enemies are disarmed and sent the way they came. Then he mentions right here, now in the next line, as St. George or Kedus Georgis, as St. George who killed the dragon. Now, he killed the dragon within the story of it. 
but yet he actually slew the dragon or conquered the dragon. He killed, he killed the dragon spiritually, but did Michael kill Satan? Michael did not, he cast him down. But remember, what he cast down was a spiritual archetype. The physical dragon or the, the, the world dragon, in that sense, is slain and is killed. So both it is, you know when it says that, and there's the eighth one, which is but is not. It is, but it is not, because it's more about our perception when we recognize what is what the dragon symbolizes. So he, who killed the dragon is the patron saint of our army as well as our allies. Let us unite by with our allies in everlasting friendship and amity in order to be able to stand against the godless and cruel dragon which has newly risen. Now, some would say, but Raj, you said that, that, that according to the ancient archetype, that St. George did not kill the dragon. His master says he's killed the dragon, right? Okay, that's, that's a point. That's a real, very important point. Now, we need to understand that because his master is also saying that let us unite with our allies in everlasting or eternal friendship and amity in order to be able to stand against the godless and cruel dragon which has newly risen and which is oppressing mankind. So a dragon resurrection, this dragon is rising up. See, this is what we have to understand. Well, what is the dragon? So the dragon can be killed, yes, or slain or conquered. Really, it's conquered and it's killed out of mind. It's killed out of a reality for that one or for that generation. But now, in our generation right now, that dragon, which St. George already slew or killed, is now raising up again. So some people can think that, well, if the dragon was slain, we no longer have any more, we no longer have any more dragon to worry about. But as Matsy tells us, that we must be able to stand against the godless. Now, see, now here we get a description. This dragon is godless without God, without the true God, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it's cruel. It is, it's about cruelty or brutality. You understand? This dragon which has newly risen, this dragon now has newly, freshly risen. So what is this dragon that was slain, but now has newly, and what has enabled it to newly rise, and this is the key, this dragon, his majesty identifies as oppressing or downpressing humanity. This particular dragon is downpressing humanity. He says, I charge you to consider them as a brother and a friend and to show them kindness and consideration to show our allies, our allies kindness and consideration. So, this particular speech is more to this speech. Remember, this is a New Day speech, the utterance of His Imperial Majesty, and, and it's from um, May 5th, 1941. Now, let's understand this. It was May 5th, 1936, when His Majesty left Ethiopia. And went into exile, and he returned five years to that very day. Now, that very day is significant, May 5th or Cinco de Mayo, in many different ways, in many different traditions. And it behooves us to investigate what, what about this day. Is, is, is there significance with this day that is celestial? Is there a heavenly significance? And let's understand the connection now, if this be so, with as it was above, you understand, as there was war in heaven, so is there war on earth. And the significance of St. Michael casting down the dragon to the earth, you understand, and therefore heaven has joy, according to Revelation. Heaven has great joy, but it says, woe to y'all who dwell on the earth. Because the dragon, let's go to that part of scripture right now. Let's go to, um, we have some of the other data sign out right here that we wanted to get into a little bit of that with you all. But hopefully we'll do that um, 
shortly. But let's get into Revelation right now concerning this war in heaven, because this is this is fundamental to understanding the 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 mystery. We can say. You understand? The history we touched on, first of all, of St. George. Who was he? We learned that he was an Israelite. Some say he was of the tribe of Benjamin. You know what I'm saying? Or Benjamin, Judah, or Judah, Benjamin, because those two tribes basically came together as one people under Judah. But he was an Israelite. You understand? He had joined the army at that particular time, fought heroically for for truth and right, as well as for the early Christians at that time who were who were who were who were manifesting and 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 demonstrating the work of God in the earth. But then, during his time, there was a a a a, a, a change of laws and times in his time. There was a change of laws and time, and those same Christians who were celebrated. Now they were persecuted. Now they were being persecuted. And he made a stand for the true faith and for our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos. Let's, let me touch on this right here, Caduce, for a moment. Caduce and Saint. It's important to kind of understand this connection right here. Because he was a saint, right? People say, yes, he was a saint. There's this false idea today that they are no longer saints, and the only saints are the saints, which the, the apostate or so-called Roman Catholic Church qualifies as saints. But that's not the understanding or overstanding that we have biblically. Biblically, we have a uh, saint is a idus, or a holy one, is one who sets themselves apart for the will of God or to do service for God. We have this in Numbers chapter 6. The so-called vow of a Nazarite is actually a vow of, for lack of a better word, sainthood or holy, the holyhood, you understand, or the true Yehuda, the Jah's hood, you understand, that the saint, the saintly, the saintliness really is holiness, and holiness from, from Kedisana means to be set apart. The basic idea, and this is something that perhaps, if you haven't looked it up, please look this up, go to the Strong's Concordance, and get to the very roots of the word, that the word that we have as saint, as holy, as sanctified, as consecrated in the various different translations, people get lost in these translations. It's like Messiah, Moshiach, Moshiach was interpreted as Christos. And everyone knows Christ or Christos or think they do, but they don't know from where it was interpreted or what is the true roots. In other words, the roots being separated from the branches and the leaves and the flowers. If, 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 if the branches and leaves and the flowers are separate from the roots, they cannot grow. That's the whole point. You understand? So they've been cut off from their roots. So I want to just define, first of all, Kiddus. It's important to define Kiddus as well as to define Georgis. Both of these we need to define Kiddus. Kiddus means holy one, one who is set apart, one who is set apart, or one who has chosen to set themselves apart. In other words, not living for themselves, not living for the world, but living for God or, or to conform their lives to the will of the Almighty. That is the qualification for Kedisana. That's the qualification for, for holiness, sanctification, consecration, so forth and so on. But there's so many distracting and false ideas that have been misassociated or what we call being lost in translation. People hear about saints. You understand? And, and they say these ones are saints. Some believe because they belong to, say, the holy rollers within certain kind of church denominations, and in other so-called denominations, is if the pope or a synod or a council or a group of folks decide to give this one sainthood. But that's all a foreign and abominable idea when we compare it to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Yehoshua HaMoshiach, when we compare it to the Bible, to the Scriptures. 
So that's a that's an important note that we want to make right there. So some will believe, well, Saint George was a saint, but 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 I can't be a saint. That's 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 not that's the wrong idea. That's the wrong approach to this particular um, spiritual programming. That's what it is. This is spiritual programming. Caduceus Georgis, in a sense, is a type of a spiritual program, and this right here is the particular code of that spiritual pro or one particular ancient code that we know from the Ethiopic uh, tradition. We know from our Ethiopic Midrash, Midrashim, or the Dersan, the Dersana. So when His Imperial Majesty, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, utilizes this particular motif, as one would call it, it it's on the crown. You know what I'm saying? It's on the crown. It's on, it's on other... Um, especially headgear and, and, and uh, hats he has it as, as that particular emblem. We have Bob Marley's um, album, you know saying, on a particular album of, of Burhana Confrontation album. It, it, it's also there where Bob Marley now is this St. George or is portrayed as a St. George type figure, you know what I'm saying, um, um, slaying or conquering or killing, one can say, killing the dragon. But still the question remains, what is the dragon? And, and how should we understand it or apply it in this particular time? And how is it connected with the whole 2012? And it's very interesting, really, the connection with 2012. What we want to do, as we said, is to break down some of the some of the basics, the, the meaning of saint. Because if you, don't, if you have a wrong application of saint, it ain't going to work for you. Let me say that again. If you have the wrong application of saint, it ain't working. It, it, ain't, it, 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 it can't work. It's almost like having when you go to a web page and a page can't show up because of a bad code. You understand? Know it's, it's a bad code. The code has to be corrected. And therefore, one has to now come from translation, the Gentile mis, mistranslation or, or from your Western white misconception of saint, and get back to the roots. Yes, it's holy, but holy also is called hallow. They say, hallow be your name, hallow. So, so a lot of these are false concepts, false ideas, which are not properly understood by people. Therefore, people cannot access it. You, you cannot access it if you have the wrong code. It's like you're the wrong access code. You can't, you can't you're not authorized. So, so misunderstanding and mistranslation Basically, it keeps you unauthorized from acting, from thinking, from, from entering into it, you know what I'm saying, for, for, from it having an application, just like the Bible. If one doesn't know the Bible, they can't really apply what's in the Scripture. It's the same thing with such ancient codes as the Caduce Georgis Code or the connection of St. George and why was and is St. George so important to us as Rastafari, but particular because he is important to his imperial majesty, to, to Ethiopia, and even to the, the British. How did the British get the St. George connection? You know, where does the St. George connection come in the British, so-called, to the British people? And now I'll just give you the, the basic overview, and we'll get into more details hopefully another time, or you can find the data and the information and the resources, the evidence out there from the black nobility. It's from that connection to the black nobility or the Hebrew, the black Hebrew and black Jewish presence in Europe, in Europe in early A.D. times, in Europe in early A.D. times. This is half of the story that a lot of people wouldn't even, it is black, black British. There were black people who were on the thrones of Europe at one time. That's where they got the idea of divine monarchy from. That's exactly where they got the idea. What happened later on is that the blood, the, the black blood, as you can see from some of the evidence that they've allowed to remain in public view, you understand the, the blood has, has gotten, you know what they call the blue blood, was really the black blood. The, the blue was, it was a code. You understand the blue blood was really the black blood, but that either got, got, got exterminated, got watered down, got persecuted, got run out with the rise of Catholicism, the, um, um, Catholicism, you know, the Catholics, 
when the Catholic connection to that war against the black against the black um, um, nobility and the black presence is connected to a couple of key events. What happened in Spain with the Moors? The Moors is a connection right there in Spain, where you had the black Arabs and you had the black uh, Jews or, or the blacks who were the original Muslims presence in Europe or the Islamic so-called presence in Europe, as well as the Jewish, the original Jewish presence in certain parts of Europe was a black blood, was a connection to black people. And, and this is something that's well known, but has been suppressed for a long time. Because if one's understood this, how would it change the whole geopolitical arrangement of the so-called world system? So that's the half. Of, that's one of one of the halves of the story that's not and that that hasn't been told. But here in chapter twelve, well now we just want to continue with the revelation part about Saint George. So we explain this holy idus means set apart, one who is set apart for God, one who is is, is separated, is separated to God for God for the Almighty service. Georgis. Let's just touch on Georgis before we move on. So we have Saint. Let's write this up here. So those of you who are taking this down can take this down. Saint basically means means one separated. One separated. And the idea is to God. You understand? Or to John, to the true God. Right? Saint. One who is separated. And we pointed to numbers. Numbers chapter uh, 6, because many of us, as Rastafari and others, have referred to the vow of the Nazarite. And the Nazarite vow says when a male or a female, man or woman, would seek to separate themselves to the Lord, that they would vow a vow of the netza, of the branch, of the separation of the branching and the separation, and they will be separated. So we have this idea of the caduce, such ones who take on such vow or such separation are called and considered caduce in the language. In translation, we have holy, saint, consecrated, sanctified, so forth, and so on. Now, George, the interesting thing right here, George means earth worker, geo, geo, Gaia, you understand, geo, georgis, georgis. This means earth, right, earth worker. And you can look this up. You, you can find this in the Webster's. We utilize the Webster's, um, the Webster's uh, Collegiate Dictionary because it has a very good etymological bracket, and they'll break down, you know, gi orgo, gi organ, gi orgo, earth, gia, gaia, orgo, you know, earth worker. So, so, so his name means earth worker. From some of the documents that we were able and privy to see, we, we learned a couple of other things about George. He's also considered, George is called um, the green one. He's called the green one or some say the ever-green one. And maybe that's a connection with the earth, you understand? And, and from the Gi part, is, it links even with, with ancient Egypt, the, the Geb. You have Geb also kind of linked in there. Now, he has a standard. His standard is usually the cross. His standard is usually the cross. Now, his real standard is this right here. His real standard is... The six-pointed star, because he was a Hebrew, right? But in the Ethiopic fashion, we have this kind of a, a, a symbology right here with, with some of the, let's see if we can do this. It's a little rough right here. But with the cross inside, hopefully you can see that from that distance right there, with the, with the cross inside the six-pointed star. Now, in Ethiopia, there's a, there's a gondar, a gondar, a gondar connection to this, where the, where the Hebrews, where the Hebrews, the faithful Hebrews or the faithful Jews, 
such as we have examples through the Ethiopian monarchy, the black Jews in particular, where they accepted the call of the Moshiach. They accepted Yehoshua as Moshiach from such a time. So in, in symbology, if you look at some of the, the symbolism, the Ethiopian symbolism, you will find um, the six-pointed star with a cross in it. This did not come from Europe, Europa. You understand? Know this came from the East. This came as a, some can say, a natural and a spiritual supernatural, but more on the progression of peoples and culture in that region of the world. So Ethiopia becomes a testimony to that black African presence, both in ancient times, in New Testament times, and coming straight down the line to modern times, revealing the half of the story that has not been told. One more point about George. George named me Earth Worker. He's often associated with the Green One and, and Al Islam and some Islamic um, mysticism or, or certain teachings of Islam. George is called Al Qadir. Al Qadir. And those of you who are Nuwabians or who have been exposed to like Dr. York and Malachi Z. York and, and Imam Isa Hadi Al Mahdi and some of his teaching from the Nuwabians and the and the Ansar uh, Islamic Hebrews, so forth and so on, know that that connection with the Green One is also connected with Saint Michael. Saint Michael. So Saint Michael and Al Qadir or Melchizedek. So all, all, all of this is connected now with Georgis. So we have St. George, literally means earth worker or the green one. In Islam, he's, a, he's known as a saint or holy one. He, he's considered to be an exemplar of martyrdom, of martyrdom, because he was martyred. In fact, according to some of the ancient legends, he, he suffered martyrdom many times although the traditional history says there was this one particular um, incident, but he, he went through struggles. He was a soldier for Christ. You know, saying He was a soldier for the truth of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he becomes an, a, an, an exa example of martyrdom, example of faithfulness, both for the Jews, for, for Christians, and even for um, uh, Mohammedans. Now, what's connected with this, George, as well, we found in one particular manuscript, there was an ancient Coptic manuscript, which had a, a cross, something like this, a so-called Coptic cross. And they said that his colors, the colors was yellow, was yellow, right, was yellow, um, green. I think the order that he said it was red, something to that effect was yellow, was green, and was red. Now, I read this, and we have the evidence to, to, to share, disseminate, and show as well. One ancient book, or a book written about George, mentioned from an ancient source that there was a particular cross, Coptic in origin, or Egyptian, as they would say, in origin, and it was painted in yellow, green, and red. And we know that this is our Sendek Alama, the Sendek Alama, is the Aranguade Beach uh, and the K, or the green, yellow, and red, which some say in the West as uh, red, gold, and green. So that connection, too, is interesting because this, in a sense, predates what one would say is the record of when Ethiopia officially adopted, officially adopted um, this sort of uh, presentation of its flag. So even this flag also is connected with Kedus Georgis. So when his majesty says that St. George was the patron saint of Ethiopia as well as of our allies, in particular he was speaking of the, the British, you know, the British Empire or the United Kingdom, it is of great, great interest. Now, as we said, St. George is connected with um, St. Michael, St. Michael or the archangel who is known as Caduceus Mikael. Now, let's touch on this right here within the, let's see how much time do we have in this, okay. Um, 
let's see if we can touch on this word, Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 12. Um, the whole chapter is of, is of great, great interest, but we're going to focus mainly on the war part. And we're going to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, where it says, And there was war in heaven. There was war in heaven. Mikael and his angels, his messengers, fought against the dragon or the dracos. And the dragon or the dracos fought and his angels and prevailed not and did not prevail. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So, so they lost their place in the heaven or in the celestial realm. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called Diablos and Satan. So the one whom mortals call Diablos or the slanderer and Satan, the opposition, is that old serpent who's identified now with that great dragon, was cast out. Now, here's a significant thing. It says that, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called Diablos and Satan, which deceiveth, here's the key, the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels, his messengers, here's where we get the connection to fallen angels, his angels and his messengers were cast out with him. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom. See now the connection with casting that great dragon, Diablo, Satan, and his angels out is connected with the kingdom of our God, the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. So it's telling us a, a, a couple of, several things, actually. One, that Diablo, Satan, old serpent, dragon, deceives. This particular dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, deceives the whole world. So the whole world, or the whole seclurum, the whole seclurum was deceived. And we want to point this out to you, too, the whole, this dollar that we have, right, this, this modern dollar, it's interesting, these seals that's on the dollar actually got put on the dollar during this same period of time, as His Majesty is testifying, roughly in the 1930s and the 40s, the same period of time was the so-called Great Seal, you know what I'm saying, the Great Seal put on this particular dollar. You understand, know which, in a sense, can be connected with that deception. What per perhaps one of the major tools of the deception of the whole world. But he was cast out into the earth. So this this heavenly dragon that caduced Mikael defeated was now cast down, cast out, and cast down into the earth and. His angels, so there were angels that were with him. Now, in the Bible, you go to the book of Jude, or the letter, the, the one chapter of Jude, you find some references there. But then behind those references in the book of Jude, or Yehuda, that we have in the Bible, the book of Jude, you find that it comes from the Ethiopic Hanok, the Ethiopic Enoch, as well as the Ethiopic book of Jubilees, or Metzhafe Kufale. So that's also very important that Ethiopia has a testimony of what the early Christians that we have their, their, their testimony in the Bible, the early Christians were reading and were familiar with the Ethiopic book of Enoch or Metzafe Hanok, as well as Metzafe Kufale or the book of Jubilees. Yet, modern Christians would, would, would be, yet modern Christians had the benefit that many of their ancestors in, in the West, many, many generations of so-called Christians in the West, just heard maybe about Enoch and maybe there was a book or something like that, but did not get to see it until recent times, which coincide with the revelation of Kedemawi Halas Lassi, behold the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, Halas Lassi the first, elect of God, king of kings of Ethiopia. So that particular age is very significant, that 1930s, in 1892, 1890s, 1930s period of time, and Revelation, and Revelation. So 
here we have where it says, and I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, of our God, and the power of his, of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the what? The blood of the lamb, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to death. So we also have a further example of Kedusciorgus. Kedusciorgus is one who also overcame, you understand, overcame this dragon or this dracos or the dragon in his time. You understand? By the blood of the Lamb and by his word of testimony, and he did not love his life to death. In other words, he was willing, you understand, to die. You understand? Because he overstood the resurrection from the dead. He overstood how to overcome that, you understand, that illusion. He, he, he was, see, see, this is the interesting thing about it, because there are some teachers and brothers uh, who are, I, I was going to mention this probably in another video, but I just mentioned it here, this particular video by, by Brother A.A. A. Rashid. You understand? A.A. A. Rashid on 2012. I don't know if you see this, if you've seen this one, but if you could get a copy of this, um, um, check it out, um, and some of his other videos. But this one here on 2012, who's watching this again, this particular video on 2012, and it's a very, very good it's a very good treatment. I think along with what we're saying here, checking out this and, and some other resources that are out there that basically are beginning to break down some of the elements of, of both ancient Mayan and ancient prophecies from, from really ancient black cultures. See, this is what's been suppressed. The whole world deceived, has been deceived by this, this dragon which is down here on the earth. So the overcoming of the dragon is possible by the blood, but blood of the lamb is also a symbolism. It's a beautiful symbolism, but it's a symbolism, you know, just like we speak today in certain slangs. You understand? We speak in certain slangs even today, and we use um, certain ways of communication that someone else in another day and age, in another day and age might not really understand, like 200 years from now, do you think that people would understand the way we use slang and the way we talk and the way we describe things? They would probably have to study. Now, this right here is another um, picture right here. You see the lamb right there? We, we mentioned it in our series on the Book of the Seven Seals. So you see the lamb and the book, Revelation 5.5. 5. So we're a little bit further down in the book using this as well as a further testimony, that particular illumination right there, that Ethiopic illumination. So the blood of the Lamb, blood is also, remember, this is a spiritual book, a metaphysical book, so we need to understand the physical, the basic truth of what the physical is telling us, but also understand it spiritually or metaphysically. You see, what Christ said, if you do not understand earthly things, how can you understand heavenly things? So blood, in this sense, is a spiritual metaphysical type. It's not just saying by literal blood, Yovas, but what blood is a symbol of, what blood is a symbol of. This is how the code needs to be understood, interpreted in order to walk in it, in order to access it, and the word of their testimony. They lo and they love not their lives to the death. Kedusky Argus represents those who dwelt in the period of time that's known as the, the Age of Martyrs. There was a time called the Age of Martyrs because there were many who were being martyred for the testimony of the true faith. And these are the ones that um, later generations of nominal Christians considered to be the one-all and end-all type of saints, most likely because the, those were real Christians who were willing to conform to the Son and the image of the Son spiritually and in truth, while modern Christians are just nominal in name. 
you know, they, they'll speak about, but they're not willing to really give that living sacrifice as the, the saints from, from on old have done. Like most would say Martin Luther King, for some black Christians and others, he's considered like a saint because he gave his life. But those who followed him were not willing to really walk in that example. And so, so we, we can understand some of the sociology of that as well as these, these, early, these early days that we speak about with Caduce Georgis, a, 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 a second, a third, third or fourth century um, uh, Christian, um, early Christian. But this is the last verse 12, so we're going to deal 12 and 12 to 12, 12. Um, it says right here, um, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell therein. In other words, those who are dwelling in the heavens, in the celestial, the heavenlies, the ETs up there, they can rejoice. You understand? They can rejoice in those who dwell. But it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. That's an interesting connection of the earth and of the sea. Now, there we can make a segue to some of the Anunnaki and the fish people and so forth and so on because it seems like there was this kind of alien or extra, extraterrestrial type of life that was coming out from the sea and from the waters and even some, in some cases in, in symbolism as dragons or like Loch Ness monster, so forth and so on. So what's the connection between those things there too? So it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the, of the earth and of the sea, for Diablos, the devil, the, the slanderer, the, the, the liar and the slanderer, is come down to you having what? Great wrath. So this one would have great wrath. It's, it's like an age of terror, almost like the king of terror and terrorism, having great wrath because, and here's the key, here, here's, here's the whole penultimate key, because he knoweth, he knoweth, not he believes, not he's guessing, no, he knows this for sure, it is what it is, he knows that he hath but a short time, that the great dragon that has been cast down to the earth, he knows, he has great wrath, why, because he knows that he hath a short time, now, this really now brings it to full cipher. And here's what we mean by this. You know the symbology of the serpent, the snake, the serpent? Because this is breaking down like what does kid do, what does holy mean, what does saint mean, according to scripture, um, both in its principle and practice. What does the name Georgis mean? We have Georgis here from the Ethiopic, the ancient. Then we have George. You understand, as a modern Anglo name, but the name Georgis and George means earth worker. He's identified as the green one. His colors of his emblem or his flag is yellow, green, red, or green, yellow, red, based on the Ethiopic colors. He's the patron saint of the imperial and holy Ethiopia, as well as our holy allies such as Britain, you understand, speaking of the original black nobility and those white folks, later day white folks who more or less have tried to carry on in that righteous tradition, you understand, or carry it on and keep it on, even though from the British side of it, the British and the European and some of the other legends around the world, we've been studying this recently, they've added in a lot of other things that have gone away from the, the, the simplicity of, of the story. And if we want to get back to the simplicity and the clearness, the, the most authenticness and genuineness, we would have to touch on some of the Ethiopic and Coptic documents. One of them I, I hold in my hand right here, the Malika A. Georgis. But in order to understand this book, to be able to, to, to understand the principles as well as, as to, to, to walk in it, you see, because it's a practical application. Why St. George was so, in a sense, one well, could say venerated or he was so highly remembered. Because he was that example of Christian courage. 
You see, and 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 and, and the Christian now could look to the example of many of the Kedusan, the holy one, to take courage, to take courage because they were closer to the you could say the historical source of it. Therefore, remembering them, remembering their stories, remembering how they took heart and how they overcome and overcame adversity was important to many of the early Christians. Unfortunately, a lot of other things have been added, like there's St. George and the Dragon, and there's a whole kind of romance that, 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 that reflects a little bit of what the original story was about, but then it adds in a lot of Hollywood and kind of make-believe. But we have to get to the original archetype. So what's the original archetype? What's the oldest archetype? That's all we touched on Revelation for a moment here. We've mentioned even ancient Egypt because we have to look now this whole idea of, 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 of um, the dragon and overcoming a type of uh, a dragon, whether ones want to call it Tiamat, you understand, or how ones might interpret it, it's important to understand that these things are old. You see, they may be newly revealed to Western, European, predominantly Christian, but many of the archetypes are, are, are and, and the mythos is much older, much more extant. This is why when we look at this period of time that we're about to move into, and we'll probably have to deal with this in another part of the um the lecture and presentation, when we look at 2012, it's interesting because in looking at 2012 and this what they call the dark riff, you know, when you look at that dark riff, we didn't, we didn't mention the dragon, give an interpretation of the dragon. Okay, the dark riff is coming up, they say, 20, 2012, where, where it aligns with the galactic center, the birthplace. And they said that this comes around every every 11 to 30, some say 13 to 11,000 years or so, depends on what perspective you look at it. But we're about to come into that, 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 um, that, that, that gateway or that gate way or that get away right now. We're, we're coming into that as we're in 2011. We can see a lot of the pro prophesied signs, biblically, scripturally, and even according to Nostradamus sort of reflections, are already happening right now with the wars, the revolutions, um, the downturn, the economy, the, 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 the psychology and the present state of, of, of the human condition, um, you know, man to man, is so unjust, ones don't know who to trust, and also the great fear. This is why we mentioned, we mentioned Brother Rashid's uh, video, because Brother Rashid's video, he kind of touched on it. He touched on some of this element, some of these elements here too. Not so much on St. George, but as we now connect the St. George with the basic science of the present time, getting a, a good um, overstanding based on knowledge and wisdom and now getting an overstanding, we can see the connection that the dragon or the dracos, in one sense of it, would represent time. The dragon would represent time. And, and, and conquering time or conquering the false perception of time. And when you look at Revelation chapter 12, that's the hint, that's the, that's the fitch, you, you know, that's the key, that's the hint that it gives us in Revelation, Ye Johannes Arai, Me'eraf Asara Hulet, Kut Asara chapter 12, verse 12, it gives us the key right there. And that key is that, First of all, the dragon has great wrath now. Now that he's cast down to, in, in, into secular and human people's affairs. In other words, before the dragon was in the heavens, but there was a war with the dragon. Now there's more to the story, but there was a war with the dragon. He was cast down by Mikael, the one who is like God. Notice the, the meaning of the name Mikael and his angels. The ancient stories go that the other angels also attempted to cast down the dragon. Some say it was a Rufael or Raphael. Others say it was Gabriel and, and, and I think maybe another archangel and his angels. But the entire, the entire battalion of angels, of, of the other archangels, were defeated. 
that they were defeated, and the only one who was able to come back, I think it's one of the Falasha, and one of the Falasha, Beta Israel, um, 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 uh, books, uh, either Tizaza, Sendet, or, or one of the other, the Ethiopian Christ, the Ethiopian Jews. They also have some ancient testaments as well. And in one particular one, we had read some years ago about how, how I think uh, Raphael and Gabriel, perhaps Uriel too, they tried to cast down and deal with the old dragon, but they were not able to. And they had lost their host. They lost their Sarawit. They had lost their soldiers. In other words, they lost their angels. Their angels were defeated by the dragon and his angels. And it was only Mikael. It was only Mikael that was able to gain the victory over, overcome the old uh, dragon and to be able to cast him down and his angels. And only him and his angels were able to defeat while the other archangels um, had, had survived as the archangels, but they had lost their, their Sarawit, they, they had lost their Tabaot, they had lost their, their particular host, which is a, another interesting part of it, but there's also more to that. Remember, these were the mythos. This was how it was, this was, how it was um, inscribed and preserved in certain types. But now as we make the connection between what these types interpret these types properly, we also have to interpret Kiddus Georgis or St. George within the bigger picture. And this particular video here, 2012, it kind of points to how, how um, the dragon, in that sense, the old dragon, um, is using, has been using fear as well in this present time, as well as a lot of distractions caught up in this system, caught up in that, in that serpent system. Now, notice something about the serpent. The serpent, in that sense, when you look at some of the, the occultic works, and we're looking at even some of I and I so-called occultic works um, from the Ethiopic tradition, and one of them is this book right here, Araguel, the book called, known as um, the Malika Araguel, and it has certain illuminations here. Which features, which features um, different type of image and writing um, in cipher, and it, it it shows a dragon and some dragons in different vis-a-vis -vis the saints and vis-a-vis -vis the whole scene of things, and the interpretation of the dragon motif, and Gerald Macy did a, a wonderful job in his work as well, is time. The, that's what the dragon and, and the devil being cast down. It's like Satan was a timekeeper, how, how some have, have, have uh, simplified it in order to try to express a basic idea. Satan was like a timekeeper. It was like that, that, old, that old system of things. And because he did not keep accurate time, because he was not able to keep accurate time, that was cast down. You know what I'm saying? But human beings, in this sense, how you deceive the world is because deceiving the way they perceive of time. Now even to us in the Holy Spirit, it's becoming clear why we did this series on, on time recently and try to touch on different aspects of, 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 of time manipulation and, and, and psychic um, twilight zone time because it's something that we, we are not able to consciously perceive because we're left unconscious about those things we should be conscious about and, and overstimulated, you understand, about this, these things which are systemic to the God of this world. You have to remember that when Satan was cast down, that old dragon, he became the God of this world. This is why when you look at how people relate to time, it's very interesting. And we're, we're, we're going to leave that there for a moment because what we'll probably do in the next part of this is clear this and come back with another part of this. But we want you to, first of all, understand some of the basics about the meaning of the, of the words, the names, how they work together, because those are the key elements. Those are the key elements that if you are wise to it, you'll begin to see that will begin to connect the dots. It's almost like one, two, three. It's like what comes after two. 
three, what comes before four, three, you know, so you'll be able to count in a certain, you'll be able to put it into a proper, a proper um, context of things. So um, we're going to touch a little bit more on Georgis and how the dark rift right now between Sagittarius and between um, Scorpio, you see, that's, that's, that's where this 2012 thing is supposed to so-called happen. And it's not the end of, it's, it's not the end of everything. It's the end of the world system. It's the end of the Gentile world dominion, what we've been calling white supremacy. This present system that has been around for at least 400, 500 plus years in almost full effect. It's also the end of the apostate church age. It's the end of the church age. And we say these things because it's what Revelation shows us. Revelation is what reveals to us what kind of an end is this end time that we're about to move into. So Kedusky Yargis is a programming, uh, a, a programming for us, if you, if you, if you can receive it. It's, it's a, it's a, by, by understanding who he was as a real person and what he faced in his time and how the Almighty helped him to overcome that dragon of time and how as, a, as, as above, so below, whatever you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. So because Kedusky Argus overcame that dragon on earth, we are now about to go through a kind of a, a, a revisiting of that point in our ancient history, in the cipher and the circle of things, what goes around, what comes around, and we're about to move into that dark rift between Sagittarius. Know the Sagittarius, they say it's half man, half beast. But then overstand that's from the Western construct. If we now look at Caduceus Georgius as, 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 as that almost Sagittarian kind of figure, which his arrow points to the tail of the scorpion, but in the Western reconstruction, the scorpion is the eagle. Now notice in Revelation about how the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly to the wilderness. Now, if you understand what was hidden from the Western hearts and minds concerning Ethiopia, then you understand the significance of that land and that region, both in ancient times as well as in modern and coming times. Remember, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. It, those who are the first shall be last, the last shall be first, and all those other ways that Christ was attempting to lay down the principles so that hopefully we would have digested that then and we can overstand what we're going through right now. So a little bit more to come on this subject matter, my brothers and sisters. Um, stay tuned. Y'all willing. Shalom.